Hello, this is the second lecture for Ancient and Medieval History during the week of Monday, November 2nd through Friday, November 6th. This is record, being recorded on Tuesday morning, November 3rd, Election Day. The agrarian social order is ubiquitous. That means it's everywhere. When you have farming and you don't have factories, you've got this agrarian or feudal social order. This social order exists in China, in Mesoamerica, in North Africa, in the Middle East, in India, in the Mediterranean, in Northern Europe, anywhere where you have farming, but you have not yet had an industrial revolution. So, this social order first appears around 10,000 years before Christ, around 12,000 years ago, and it uh, continued in England until the early 1800s. It continued in the United States until the late 1800s. The same is true in Germany. And uh, there are parts of the world that are just industrializing now, where the feudal order, like China, existed very, very late into the 20th, certainly into the 20th century, uh, maybe into mid-century, and some would argue that communism has restored this feudal social order, just with a party at the top. In any event, it's a pyramid. Power is at the top, obedience is at the bottom. People at the top owe people at the bottom good decisions. People at the bottom owe people at the top obedience, loyalty goes both ways. Now, atop this social order, and I'm going to use the Western medieval system because it's the most familiar, but the Chinese, the Olmecs, the Aztecs, uh, the Arabs, the Babylonians, uh, the Maurya Empire in India, the Japanese, all have some variant of this system. It's essentially the same. What's going to stand out in the Western system is there's an independent church. Usually the church and the state are together and the state dominates, usually. But in the West, there's that difference. So, atop the social order in the medieval West is the Lord God Almighty, God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the God of the monotheistic gods of Christians, Jews, and Muslims. But... In any of these societies, ancient Egypt, ancient Babylon, ancient Greece, the gods are above the human social order. So, above the human social order is the divine, the divinities, the gods or God. Below the human social order are the beasts and the natural world. Human beings are given dominion over this earth. Pretty much every pre-industrial society agrees on this. You, as an environmentalist, may think that you and me, baby, are just one other species, but in fact, among many, but in fact, human beings who especially have a lot of close relationships with animals and with uh, growing things, uh, understand that we are different. And so traditional pre-industrial societies all around the world place human beings above nature. Now, we may have a reciprocal relationship with nature. We may want to not anger nature. We certainly don't want to mess with the gods who control nature. But nature, in general terms, is under us, and we are under the gods or God. Now, let's look at the social order itself. Atop the social order, fewer than 1% of any given population are royalty. In Europe, that's the Holy Roman Emperor. That's the kings of the various countries. But also, since we have a religious section, that is the Roman Pope, the leader of the Roman Catholic Church, that branch of Christianity, and his curia, which is his, uh, his papal uh, court. That's royalty. Royalty of one kind or another make up less than 1% of the population, and they are the rulers of the large states and the large institutions like the church. Immediately below the royalty from whence most royals come are the nobility and the high clergy. The nobility are baronets, barons, counts or margraves, dukes, grand dukes, or princes. 
Although princes usually are a royal title, but some people get them confused. In any event, let's use the term dukes. So, you got barons, counts, and dukes. In uh, the church system, you also have the cardinals, or the princes of the church. You've got the archbishops, and you've got the bishops. These are the high clergy. So, in the state, you've got the barons, counts, and dukes going up the thing, dukes being higher than counts, being higher than barons, and you've got the cardinals who are higher than the archbishops who are higher than the bishops. They're not royalty exactly. They rule over regions of the kingdom or of, the, uh, of Christendom. They rule over regions in the name of the royals under God. So, if you have a king in London and you've got a duke in Cornwall, which is southwestern England, and you've got a baron at Torquay, uh, he's not in Cornwall, a baron of Scilly, which is, a, believe it or not, the Scilly Isles, S-C-I-L-L-Y, um, it's the baron runs the Scilly Isles, uh, the Duke of Cornwall runs all of Cornwall, and uh, the king runs all of England. The baron runs the, rules the people, the baron works for the duke who works for the king. The nobility rule over regions. And the same thing is true within the church. Cardinals and archbishops and bishops rule over dioceses and archdioceses that are regions of the church faithful. And they mimic old Roman provinces or even small American states or large counties. The word county refers to a region that a count would rule. The nobility make up, well, maybe 3% of the population, give or take. So less than 1% of the, fewer than 1% of the population are royals. And 3% of the population, maybe a little more, maybe a little less, depending upon when and where you are, because we're talking a huge period of time when this agricultural, when this agrarian social order is in play. Uh, but about 3% of the population are nobles and high clergy. Below them... You've got about 6% of the population. They are soldiers and low clergy. Warriors are above other people. So in an agrarian social order system, a person who works with weapons, who serves the king, who serves God, or who serves the baron, who serves the king, who serves God, is uh, has a more noble profession of higher status than a banker or a scribe or a lawyer and a head accountant uh, or a, a doctor even in certain situations. The service that noble, that warriors give. Why? Because warriors put their lives on the line for others. The old Roman Republic thought so much of military service that they didn't let anyone become a citizen until they had served in the legions that serving in the legions and putting your one and only life on the line for your country is what earned you the right to participate in voting. And the Roman Republic lasted as a functional republic twice as long as the American Republic has thus far. So they knew something about something uh, because that system worked. In any event, soldiers and low clergy. Soldiers protect. Low clergy are monsignors, priests, monks, nuns, the people who handle the local faithful. About 6% of the population. So, so far, we're dealing with about 10% of the population. This is a high figure that are involved in ruling or leading or protecting in some way, shape, or form. The top 10% of the population, give or take, depending upon time and place. This social order is in place during the time when the pyramids were built and when Napoleon fought his wars. We're talking over thousands of years of time. In Napoleon's time, the people at the top were a larger group. The people in this next group in particular. In the Pharaoh's time of Cheops or Khufu when he's building the great pyramids at Giza, the rulers are, are a smaller proportion of the population. Now, below the rulers are the townsmen or the freemen. The townsmen or the freemen compose maybe 10 to 20% of the population. This is where the real play is. 
You've got about 20% of the population in revolutionary France or Napoleon's time. Uh, and you've got, uh, that, that, that's about 20%. And you've got uh, maybe 10% in ancient Egypt under Khufu or Cheops as the pyramids are being built. So what is a townsman or a free man anyway? Well, they're a person who through their skills earns a living. They're not born to the land like a peasant, serf, or slave. They're not born to rule like a noble or a royal, uh, or even many soldiers. They have to earn their living by being smart and hardworking. In other words, this is the middle class. The agrarian or feudal social order applies to all sorts of people. All sorts of people except those who live in towns or cities. In the countryside, you're born into your role. You are what your daddy does. But in the city, you are what you do, what you choose. Cities are filthy. They are stinky. They are flea and rat infested disease hubs that unless you live in ancient Roman cities, have terrible sanitation and therefore have human and animal waste piling up in the streets until the rains come and clear them away whenever that happens to be. City air is stinks on ice, but it's free air. Because in the cities, if you can get a job, you can make money. And it doesn't matter who your father is. Not really. It matters what you can do. Are you a blacksmith who can work steel or iron? Are you a coppersmith who can work copper? A tinsmith who can work tin? Are you a person who uh, makes barrels? Are you a barrel wright? Do you make barrel staves? Are you a, 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 a potter? who makes clay pots or pottery? Are you um, a fisherman? Eh, that's on the edge. But some fishermen live in towns uh, and rather than in country villages. Are you a, uh, a member of the town guard? There's also a, you know, you're a city person, but you also have to fight. Are you a scribe? Which is the combination of the modern professions of lawyer and accountant. What do you do? Do you bank? If you're a Jew, uh, one of the good things that you can do is you can work in banking because in the Middle Ages, as you will learn, uh, Christians consider loaning money at interest to be a mortal sin. So are you a banker? Do you work the needle trades? Are you a weaver? Are you uh, somebody who, so what? Do you make glue? Do you make leather goods? Do you make shoes? Are you a cooper who repairs shoes? What do you do? Not who your father was. That's what determines your destiny. And the number of townsmen or freemen who are these crafters, these, these middle-class people who make their skills, including doctors, by the way, including doctors, uh, they are what determine how sophisticated your society is. So now in the most munificent of the ancient, uh, of the agrarian societies, we're talking, again, Napoleonic era of France around the year 1800, 30% uh, of the population has been covered so far. 1% royals, 3% nobles, 6% soldiers and low clergy, and 20% uh, townsmen. In the more scrimy, primitive of the agrarian societies like ancient Egypt, Maybe we're dealing with 20% of the population, maybe even less. So who's the rest? Who's the majority? Who's everyone else? Well, they are from 70 to actually in some places as high as 95% peasants, serfs, and slaves with the technology of primitive farming. You need at least 70% of your people, maybe more, maybe 80%, maybe more, maybe 90, 95% on the land growing food. If you don't have from 70 to 80 or 90 or 95% of your people on the land growing food, there's going to be starvation. And society will fall apart and either change and become something else where, the, where you do put 70 to 90 or so percent of your people back on the land, or you're conquered by a foreign power that puts 
between 70 and 90 or so percent of your people back on the land to grow food because that's what needs to happen. Before factories, before industry, at the technology level of farming, uh, between the agrarian revolution, 10,000 years before Christ, the industrial revolution, about 200 years ago in Northwest Europe and the, Amer and the United States, in that vast area, you need at least 70%, probably more, of your people growing food. What if they don't want it? Well, that's why they're peasants, serfs, or slaves. The worst off are slaves. Slaves are human tools. They're property. They have no legal significance as people. They have no moral significance as people. In fact, Christianity, when it comes along, is one of the only religions that actually takes slaves as real people and treats them as children of God. In most other ancient cases, slaves lose their humanity. Where do slaves come from? Well, if you fight in a war and lose and surrender rather than die, you're going to be made into a slave. And any children that you have are going to be born into slavery. You are a human tool. You are a rake. You are a shovel. You are a farm implement. You're a household appliance. People will use you any way they like, and you've got no recourse. You have to take it, or you kill yourself, or you try killing your master, which usually fails. In which case, whatever you love is going to be taken out as well. Whoever you love is going to be taken out as well. Because uh, up, uppity slaves uh, are considered to be like bad apples. If you've got one, you'd better throw out the whole barrel because the entire bunch has been spoiled. Slave uprisings are some of the nastiest uprisings in human history. And we'll be talking about a few of them as we go through time. Particularly coming up is the Spartacist Rebellion uh, under Spartacus in Roman times. So slaves, you can use them whatever way you like. Serfs. Serfs are better off than slaves for a couple of reasons. Serfs are not portable. You can buy a slave or sell a slave away from their natural family. It happens all the time. Marcus Portius Cato the Elder talked about when a slave wears out, sell him. Just get rid of him like an old broken tool. Um, who cares where he ends up? He may end up in the glue factory. It doesn't matter. He's a slave. But a serf can't be sold away from their land. Serfs come with the land like leather bucket seats come on a luxury car. Serfs stay on the land their whole lives, which means, no, serfs can't say no to their masters. If a serf is told to do something that they don't like, uh, they have to do it, uh, or they have to die. Um, but in general terms, serfs are the people of the land. If you buy or sell the land, the serfs come with it. That's it. So serfs get to stay with their people, uh, and they never leave their land. That's better than a slave who can be bought or sold at the whim of the master. Then you've got peasants who are the best off. And most of our ancestors in Europe, by numbers at least, were peasants. Peasants had to stay on the land. They were legally obliged to. But peasants could choose to become more industrious. Peasants could make their own money. They could, under the law, own their own land. They could own their own home. They could employ other peasants. A peasant that's industrious and clever and hard, you know, uh, basically willing to do the extra work can become well, you know, reasonably wealthy, country wealthy, and live a very comfortable life. Can they leave the land? Not without the Lord's permission. Can they travel? Can they move? No, not without the Lord's permission. So in that sense, they're bound. They're partially slave in that they're stuck on the land. But while on the land, they have many privileges that nobody else on the land has. So the majority of the population, from 70 to as high as 80 or even 90 or 95 percent, depending upon the time and place you're talking about, were peasants, serfs, and slaves. So there's the social order, and it's pretty ubiquitous. One of the big differences between Europe and the United States, up to the present moment anyway, is that Europe could not escape from its feudal past. Wherever you were 
however free you wanted France or England or Germany to be, or Spain or Italy, or, or Sweden for that matter. You have the fact that on this land for a couple thousand years and more, that family ruled, that family fought, that family did work in the towns, and all these other families grew food for them in their service. And having a society of equals that comes out of such a stratified society, that's a toughie. That's a tough one. Our next lecture is going to be on uh, the first region of pre-classical civilizations, which is Mesopotamia.